All right, so uh, I will be sharing some research that I've been doing um, and explorations that I've been doing for the past uh, time for a bit of for a while on uh, omni specialized design and speculating features. Uh, so this has been an area of just being someone that loves art and um, finding art uh, an amazing vehicle for art being design in that it's no longer self-serving, but instead it's a, a form, a way to create something beautiful for others to experience and thinking about how design can be a practice that brings liveness in the same way that art does as well. So as Christina mentioned uh, for my bio, I am a creative technologist at Google and I'm generally, a, I'm also a designer at Google um, and have been a researcher at New York University and also an educator at NYU in the ITP program. And I feel like in being an educator, um, it's such a fortunate experience because I get to learn from my students. Uh, and I feel like I'm constantly, um, you know, just the opportunity of being a student for me is the most exciting part. Uh, and then at the core of all of that is very much, as I mentioned, art of art has been what has guided me through all of my life and what makes me the most excited. And so it's been a, a matter of finding what are great vehicles that I can use that influence my art. And then also that brings new life to my art for other people to experience and creative technology and design have been uh, amazing vehicles for that. So when I say, what, what do I mean when I say omni-specialized design for beautiful futures? Because um, this idea of omni-specialized can be a whole, you know, that's a, that's a lot to untangle of what does that actually mean? And I, I think I actually got the term omni-specialized from Buckminster Fuller. Uh, if any of you have ever read his work, um, I think it's uh, Spaceship Earth, the book on Spaceship Earth, um, a manual for Spaceship Earth, that book talks a lot about this idea of um, design being something that we, or just like career and our approach to systems have often been something where we're thinking very singularly and we kind of specialize in certain areas and how a lot of power can come when we think very interdisciplinary. And so for me, I've, I've always been someone that's very interdisciplinary and thinking about a lot of different things. But when I saw that use of the word of omni-specialized, for me, that grounded my work in uh, creating an umbrella for this practice of not being tied as we often are taught to, tied to one area and thinking that all of our work has to surround printmaking or architecture or fashion design, but that we can actually blend a lot of these different ideas and technologies and that they really, um, excel all of these different areas when we combine the different techniques that we're engaging in in one area and use that in another area. So as I explored this, I also did a lot of reading on other people that are in the field, uh, in the design field and also outside of it. Um, and one of my favorite quotes by Benjamin Bryan, who's a theorist and philosopher, says that the job of design in the 21st century is to undo much of the design of the 20th. And I think this is a very liberating quote as a designer and as someone that's engaging in the world, and even someone that's, for anyone that's not in the design world, to understand that we are living in something that someone else has designed, and it's up to us if we feel like it's sufficient enough for us or not. And we can reject the system in which we live and approach design very differently. We can redefine what design is. And I think it's, it's important to understand your agency within the field that you're in um, and allow you to understand that you can make the change that you want to, and you can actually discern if this is something that's acceptable or not. Uh, Dunham Raby says, all good critical design offers an alternative to how things are. And I think this is also an important reminder, uh, just as the last quote saying that we don't have to accept things as they're presented to us. We don't have to accept the way that we're being trained, the way that we're being taught, the way that we're experiencing life. We can actually discern and decide uh, if this is or not, and we can create an alternatives if it's not. So, I spent a lot of time thinking about design and rethinking what design is. For one, what is the role of a designer? Is it someone that's interdisciplinary? Are they a bridge between different communities? Are they including people uh, that are being served in the design team? What are the principles of building that we're building design off of? Often where it's traditionally off of European enlightenment, um, the, role of, and the role of nature and how can we use that as an example of great design and ways to design. What are these different ideas around design? So there's respectful design, biomimocratic, speculative design, working backwards. And so I'll touch on all of these throughout the presentation. So step back, what is the role of a designer? Oftentimes we assume that the, the role is someone that's visionary, they're a leader and they're independent. So it's this like sole person that has they're, they're, they're exemplary, they are um, you know, the, the lone wolf, they are the person that's carrying everyone forward. 
and we put a lot of responsibility uh, in their hands. They have a lot of agency and they also maybe too much power though. I think we need to think, rethink about uh, the responsibility of a designer and how we interpret their role. And I would like to push back on this idea that they are the visionary, they're independent, like they're these lone people that have all of this amazing talent and that we have to listen to everything that they say, but instead reflect on words by Victor Papanek who is an amazing designer and an amazing design philosopher who says design has to be done by a team. This team must not consist of only somebody who is a designer. It must consist of people from other disciplines. And I think this is a really important quote because it re-identifies the role of a designer. It's not that this designer is coming in and they have all the expertise in the world and they're going to impose their expertise, but it's more of design has to be done within a group of people and it can't be just with people that consider themselves as designers, but it has to be people that consider themselves outside of the world of design because there's a lot to learn from when you're bringing people of different fields together. It also, Victor also continues to say, the most important team member besides the designer is the member of the user group. Um, and user, I think that's a, a complicated word for me. I don't generally like to use the word user. Um, and I think a lot of people have spoken about this like sort of discomfort with the idea of user because it actually flattens the identity of the person that would be considered a user. Um, it gives, sort of gives them a monolith. It doesn't really give them a voice. It doesn't uh, allow you to think very intentionally about who they are. You kind of just see them as a person on the receiving end. But instead it's really important for me to think critically about them not just being this user but they are the intended beneficiary. They are the person that I'm creating this to benefit from. And I need to think very specifically about who they are and what do they need as the designer. And I think another really important element of a designer is that they are the bridge. They are the mediator across uh, of a team of different roles. So at the center, at the core, there may be the designer because the designer has the ability to speak different languages. And these languages are people of different fields. So this designer can interpret and understand someone of a science background and find a relationship between a scientist and an artist, and then also a community member, and then an engineer, and then a historian. So they're working with all these different people in tandem. They're creating a, a positive and conducive environment for everyone to work together. And also important uh, to have the community member um, in there of maybe you're creating for a community. Who is that person? It's understanding that there's lived, the, the importance of lived expertise and the importance of a variety of different forms of expertise that aren't always taught in programs, university programs in school, but um, through other arenas and how uh, we want to make sure that everyone's voices are heard. Another really important philosophy of mine is to design with and not for. So um, it's important to think as you're designing uh, these projects, you're entering communities, that it's not so much that you are this person that's coming from an outside, from you're an outsider within this environment, and that you're gonna create something for these group of people, for this event, for whatever it is. It's more of your working with the people that are very familiar, that have expertise uh, because they are in the midst of this community and you're designing with them. It's a conversation, it's not a monologue. So I have a few different case studies of where I've explored this method of, and, and really explored this method before I even started thinking about um, specialized design as a practice, but more of these are just, this is just the way that I've engaged in design all throughout my career and uh, have found a great umbrella term for it. And so Afrotectopia, as was mentioned, which is a social institution that I founded, the revolution will be digitized, which is an NYU course that I taught uh, and building a museum 355, 353 years in the future, which is a speculative design uh, project that I embarked on. So Afrotectopia, Afrotopia is a social institution fostering interdisciplinary innovation at the intersections of art, design, technology, black culture, and racial activism. So this is a space that I created in 2018 while I was a graduate student at New York University's Interactive Telecommunications Program. And I created it because of a variety of different reasons. For one, I was so excited about the art and tech world and uh, loved all the possibilities and all the things that I was able to create. And I was just really excited about finally being able to be in a space that's merging art and technology so seamlessly. 
um, and saw how as difficult as technology comes across as being, it actually can be something that's very approachable if for one, it's just taught in the right way. If it's taught in a way where, um, you know, the teacher doesn't, miss, the teacher is much more approachable. I think it can be very easy for technology to seem like a very daunting area when um, it's not taught in the right way. And uh, when you're able to bring in your own interests and naturally my interests surrounded a lot of different cultural ideas. So I was thinking a lot about race and black culture within my projects and having that opportunity to bring my own interests within this world that felt sort of foreign to me at the time because I wasn't a programmer or, and I hadn't done much with electrical engineering to bring my own ideas into this space was really exciting and inspiring for me uh, and encouraged a lot of agency. But what I also saw was not many other people, uh, not many other black students, no other full-time black faculty. I was, I felt like a, 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 I felt very siloed within the tech world because there just wasn't much uh, presence of black people within the space. And so I wanted to explore how can I create something that actually centered the black experience? How could I create a conversation around art and technology that didn't add blackness and race as an add-on, but instead it was at the core of what we were discussing. How can I allow for other black people to see themselves in the space, even though it's very hard for us to find each other? And how can I create a space where we, the people that are in the space can be celebrated, braided by their own people and have people that are not within the space see them and be inspired by them and encouraged to enter the space. So I was tackling all of these different ideas and it was all a matter of figuring out how can I uh, create this. And so for one, it was very much a bias for us initiative of I'm creating literally something for myself. And I think that's one of the best things you can do as an entrepreneur and as someone that's creating something is you wanna create something for yourself because you know what your own needs are, you know why you have not been, uh, why you need it, why someone else might need it. Like you have a very great understanding of it. It's very, uh, it's a very intuitive process. Um, and it's not, uh, you're coming from an outside and you're designing for a different group. And so Africtopia, it started off as an annual festival where we were collaboratively designing Black futures, we're sharing research, we're highlighting and celebrating innovative work. It's also taken the form of a school. So it's been an alternative adult school where it's, and that's happened for a few years, a couple of years, where it's either in person or people are coming in uh, and taking all these courses on ways that you can merge art and tech, but also through a cultural lens. And then we've also had a summer camp um, where it's teaching STEAM to Black youth and immersing culture and race at the very start of the, the technology work that we're doing and making sure that they understand that this is not a foreign concept, that race and culture uh, and African practices are all very hand in hand when it comes to technology. And so the objective of Afrotopia was to design and realize healthy and sustainable black futures with or without technology, though it is our tool of choice. And it's important that uh, for one, it's understood that it's with or without technology because I, I felt like that would be more inclusive to people. It's all about how you're presenting this initiative, but it would allow for more people that are not technologists to feel like they can enter this space and be invited to think about this. But at the essence and core, what we're doing is we're trying to realize healthy and sustainable black futures. Well, when you're trying to realize and uh, manifest these futures, and that you want them to be healthy and sustainable, it's important that you're not driven and guided by one field, one form of expertise, but that you have a very holistic and comprehensive approach to engaging with design. And so then that encouraged uh, me to make sure that this is a space where people of a variety of different fields feel like they can enter this space. So from our very first event, we had people that were from engineering backgrounds, artist backgrounds, science backgrounds, public policy, law, education, uh, healthcare, all sorts of fields where uh, panels were designed so that people can see, okay, this is a space where I can talk about economics and business and entrepreneurship. I could also talk, I also see another panel on artistry and working in museums. I also see another panel on um, algorithms and bias and that relationship to the law world. Um, and so making sure that's an inclusive space, this then allows for a lot of really exciting conversations to happen because it's not just a bunch of technologists in the room talking about the different softwares and libraries they're using, but it's instead a space that's very inclusive of a bunch of different people where an artist can contribute to a conversation with a few different technologists and give them a whole new perspective, same with all the other different fields. With the course Revolution Will Be Digitized, it was also a similar approach. This is a course that I designed uh, inspired by Joe Scott Aron's The Revolution Will Not Be Televised. 
uh, and also building off the work of Norbert Wiener in cybernetics, also reflecting on what past events like Egypt's Tire Square to Black Panther Party to this idea of post-work societies and beyond. It was a space that was comprehensive of a bunch of different ideas. And though these ideas can feel like they range a lot from an album by Joe Scott Ron to a protest and a social movement like Tahrir Square to uh, a social justice uh collective like the Black Panthers Party to even like way uh, early forms of interactive technology like Norbert Wiener cybernetics, all of these have a relationship between each other. And it's just a matter of finding that thread to show the relationship between each other. So in designing this course, it was designed to explore the societal and uh, impacts of technology of examining how race and socioeconomics and power have historically operated within America. It was setting ways those tactics are embedded into technology today and potentially into the future. It engaged in a variety of speculative design practices and it designed an equitable technoculture futures manifesto. So we were doing a lot. We were setting the past. We're seeing the relationship of what happened in the past as far as technoculture and how that was embedded in politics, public policy, race, society, uh, looking at how it's influencing today, thinking about how it may influence the future, designing potential futures, and then creating a whole manifesto of uh, this kind of being like a, a law system for any other tech uh, institution to abide by and make sure that they're creating healthy and sustainable uh, products and systems. And then when it came to building a museum 353 years in the future, this was a speculative art practice that I engaged in where it was exploring the eradication of racial oppression in future times through speculative design and futuristic ideating of a utopian city and society. And so this was a practice where I was thinking, uh, and it's a lot of where Afrotopia has uh, entered into. Afrotopia initially, it was very reactive. It was very much of, I don't see enough black people in the tech world. I don't know enough black people. There's not really a, a, a cohesive and strong community of us that know each other. How can I solve that? How can I create a pipeline into different tech companies so that it's easier for black people to get into these uh, spaces? It was very much of, this is how the world is. Let me start from where the world is and respond to that. Where I was building a museum 350 years in the future was, let me remove myself from the world. Let's actually not pay attention to the world, what the world is doing. And let me just design something that I think would be healthy and beautiful and uh, engaging for people. And it's purely on imagination. And it's not so much of a response or reaction, but it's actually being proactive. And it's also actually inviting others to do this along with me, a step very far in the future and design this world uh, with me. So the process for this was, starting off creating a vision. How do we want to live? Then it was existing in that vision. What would we like, uh, what, what would we like it to be? Um, how do we want, how, what would it be like to live in that state? And then working backwards from that vision. How do we get to our desired state from where we are today currently? So it's designing this far out future, 350 years in the future, and then stepping back to where I am today and reflecting on what do I need to do now in order to get there? And so that's a whole different way of ideating uh, oftentimes with design, we're responding to the moment in very near future, nearsighted. But if we're farsighted and we have this ver uh, future of what we want, then it's a matter of designing backwards. And that's a whole different approach. Um, it can be very liberating and also allow for a lot more imagination. So then I started to think about what principles are we building design off of? What is it that we value and what, what sort of system are we uh, engaging in when we are designing? What are the things that we're thinking about? What's our metric system? Since European enlightenment, uh, design has generally been, uh, we've, what we've generally focused on is industrialization and capitalism. Okay, so how has that influenced the way that we're engaging in design? For one, um, I read this book called Low Tech, uh, Radical Indigenism um, in a Design Practice by Julia Watson. And she laid this out beautifully for me of, she said that there's a mythology of technology where we think it, is, it exists at the center of humanism, colonialism, and racism. Uh, and so when we think that, when we think about how technology uh, has existed within that core, within that concentric circle of the, these ideas of humanism and colonialism and racism, which also inherently produce capitalism, uh, and how it's actually severed. It's been severed for a long time between local wisdom and ancestral intelligence and indigenous innovation. That leaves us with our design framework of, of much of how we're operating today, of very much of how can we create 
efficient systems where we're not thinking about sustainability? How can we create systems that continue to uplift people that already have plenty of resources and not thinking critically about those that don't? Now we can distribute resources and make it make the world more equitable and how we're ignoring the genius and expertise of people that understand systems, indigenous people, natural systems, um, the ancestral intelligence, local wisdom of certain areas. And we're imposing these very Western and Eurocentric views uh, everywhere. And we think that's uh, universalism, but it's actually, it's very, um, it's, not, it's not local wisdom, which is a lot more powerful to different um, spaces. And so then that had me diving into Arturo Escobar's work, where Arturo says, all living human or not takes place within a relational matrix. The forgetting of this fact led to the development of patriarchal cultures. So this for me means um, that we are all interconnected. We are all like, it, it's not even a, a human, uh, it's not a human centric world. Um, it's a sentience centric world. It's all living things have a interconnected experience. And when we don't think about that, when we design human-centered design practices where we're purely thinking about how is this going to affect humans and we're not thinking about all sentient beings, this continues to uh, push forward this idea of uh, how we have a patriarchal culture that's influencing much of the way that we're engaging in design practices. Von Warhoff says, if we want to live in a different world, we need to transform our desires. And for this, we need to change our conversations. This is possible only by recovering matristic living. The matristic manner of living intrinsically opens up a space for coexistence. So the world that we're living in, we're, we're living in this world because we desire it, because this is what we're comfortable with. But if we change the way that we're uh, identifying this system, this world, and change our conversations around it, we can actually engage in something that's a lot more about interconnectedness and coexistence. Uh, similar to what a matristic way of life would be opposing the patriarchal world that we've lived in. And so for me, uh, I think the most perfect technology is nature. How is nature operated? What, what system uh, does nature uh, create decisions based off of? What are its values? Uh, who is it serving? Who is it not serving? And so when we think about nature and its role in impacting design, we can think about economies, how have economies uh, could be, how could economies be affected by a sort of biomimocratic form of design? Well, with traditional economies, we have a, a linear economy which profits off of obsolescence, so waste. We have to produce waste, and that waste then allows for what is not waste to become more valuable. So we have raw materials, we use it in production, it then becomes a, a tool, a product, an item, and then it becomes non recyclable waste. Um, and that's what creates value. That's, that's our metric for a value system or it's influence our value system. And as much as I love Apple, Apple's one of my favorite brands. Apple is also an example of profiting off of this obsolescence of with every upgrade, we have a new phone for whatever reason, we have to have a new phone every year with these new phones. A lot of the time we're changing the charger. So we can't even use the same devices that we've used in our past devices. So it's creating a lot of ways. It's, op it's making items obsolete that we paid a lot of money for. And what happens with those uh, items once they become obsolete? And so I've been thinking a lot about circular design where nothing goes to waste. And this is very uh, typical of nature. In nature, nothing is going to waste. Everything is constantly being reused and turned into something else. And so with the circular economy, uh, influenced by circular design, we would have raw materials. We would produce with those raw materials, we would use it, and then we would recycle. So how can we create a relationship where everything that we're using is then serving some, another purpose and it, it never becomes a form of waste? Similar to how, I mean, the most basic natural systems work of uh, the, the movement of water and it's transforming, being evaporated, turning into condensation, then rain, and then again, turning it, feeding into our large bodies of water or food and life, just general life of growing food, harvesting it, eating it, cooking it, uh, composting it, that nutrient, uh, turning it to nutrients in the soil and then it grows something else. How can we create uh, circular economies that are based off of a circular design that's so successful in the natural world? And there are some people that have explored it. There is uh, a recycled plastic fabric yarn, which Bionic used at some point, um, and they use plastic to then create apparel and footwear and material for cars. Uh, and 
though this wasn't purely circular and that it did eventually create waste, but it turned what we have, what we consider a lot of as waste, even though we recycle it, it gave it a whole new life. It gave plastic a whole new life uh, and allowed it to be something that we use, that we would use on a consistent basis. It's getting closer to circular design, um, though it's not completely there. I think it's a start and I think we need to continue thinking about how can we continue pushing towards circular design. And then as we continue, continue thinking about human-centered design, which is an area that I was very excited about in my earlier years, and I think there's also, there will always be relevancy for human-centered design. I think there's always a role for it. But how can we push away from human-centered design uh, and, and not think of it as something that's applicable to everything? And one thing that I love that Dory Turnstall said, who's Dean of OCAD, is why are we creating these boundaries between the human and the non-human, the flora and the fauna and the supernatural? Are there other values or principles that we can take into account that will bring us closer as opposed to creating divisions? Because for a really, really long time, we've been designing with the exclusion of all other life forms. And so we're thinking about human-centered design very specifically. We're thinking about how can we best serve the human experience? How can we best serve human living conditions while completely ignoring the sentient existence that surrounds human existence and all sentient experiences that are being affected by the human experience. And why are we creating this division? Why is there a sort of superior understand, superior respect to human life and not that same uh, respect given to sentient life that is not human? And so for me, it's, it's very much about pushing away from this idea of human-centered design, but instead thinking about ecologically-centered design. How can we create design that is beneficial of all sentient life? And so this is design that is anti-siloed, anti-dichotomized, and pro-whole systemized. And so what does that mean? What would that look like? An example of that are the case studies that I showed before but also how that can be uh, explored through pedagogy and research that is interdisciplinary and gives a fuller picture. So when we think of sciences and how we generally explore uh, university campuses, we have the science building uh, or the science area of the camp of the university where we have chemistry building and biology, we have humanities in another area. So this is you know, anthropology and uh, public policy and all the, the humanities related courses. And what we're doing is we're actually, it's harmful to think about the world in a way that's uh, creating these dichotomies between these different fields when they actually have a really strong relationship and a necessary relationship between each other. Sciences are always political, but we have this apolitical identification of sciences because we think that what science is, is fact. That whatever science presents itself to be is a fact. But actually science is purely actually a perspective. Science is presenting a perspective of a system, of some, a way of something is uh, working. And it's dependent upon the person that is observing this instance and their political beliefs that actually determines uh, the science of that, of the, the fact of uh, that experience. And humanities gives um, different based on understandings based on who is observing which is second wave cybernetics. So I mentioned Norbert Wiener before, uh, who's the founder of cybernetics, but there's also this idea of second wave cybernetics, which also should be influencing science a lot more. Uh, second wave cybernetics, which was uh, thinking about uh, techniculture, but not strictly within the techniculture sphere, but actually within the humanities sphere. Se second wave cybernetics is a product of the sciences and humanities coming together with an anthropologist and a computer scientist and engineer coming together and thinking about what does it actually mean when we think about this feedback loop that exists within cybernetics. Cybernetics is basically this idea of a loop that everything is, there's a feedback loop, that there's a cause and effect. What cyber, second wave cybernetics actually does is it removes you from this first person perspective of this cause and effect. Um, and it allows you to understand that you are a person that's observing this cause and effect and that you're, you're, the way that you are interpreting it is what then becomes this idea of a fact or science. It's, that per, it's the interpretation of something happening, your interpretation of it. And that reminds me of uh, an amazing uh, article that maybe I'll, I'll share in Q&A um, on Octavia Butler and Octavia Butler's observations of slime mold and how scientists before her saw slime mold as an amazing um, example of a form of efficient design. Uh, this could be something that is used to, and it was actually used to influence 
uh, metro systems and the ways that trains navigate public transportation systems of observing slime mold and the way that it moves and uh, efficiently navigates spaces. And Octavia Butler instead saw this as something that's not purely about how can we create more efficient systems, but understand the queerness, that there's actually a, a queerness to slime mold where it's not about identifying it based on how we understand people to be as a binary of a this or a that, but understanding that's a complex system that it is encompassing of a lot of different identities and that we need to respect that, the identity of that and not impose our ideas. So these are two different people that are studying a form of science, but have a very different understanding of it, which then continues to say that science is, it's not this apolitical thing, it's actually very political. And then when we think about it through a second wave cybernetics is very much dependent on who is absorbing and uh, how they understand the world and what they're imposing to then allow for an understanding of it. With the course, the revolution will be digitized. Again, this was a compilation of a lot of different ideas. So it was, this course was designed to explore technology and surveillance and design and politics and media and public policy and sociology and economics and ecology and military, all of these. When traditionally, when we have courses that are thinking about how can we think more equitably about computer science, it's pretty much just computer science and then uh, you know some ideas around race and uh, a society and just how people function between each other, but it's not thinking about uh, economics, about public policy, about urban design and how urban design then created forms of public policy that we're continuing today that are segregating people that still allow for places like New York City to be one of the most segregated uh, education, public, uh, public education uh, spaces, or it's uh, technology's earliest days and how that was rooted in surveillance done by military in the Vietnam War and how all of these they have a relationship between each other and that we really have to look at them as a cohesive system if we actually want to understand it and when we just silo different areas we're not getting a full picture. So thinking of ways to design, um, a, another quote from Dory Turnstall says, a key ethos to respectful design is an understanding of how things can have many different meanings for different people how we recognize the intrinsic worth of everything and everyone, not because they may be useful to us, but because they exist in the universe. They have a meaning and a purpose that is their own. I think this is really, really important uh, just as a, on a human level of respecting the people that are around you, not because maybe they're gonna serve you, not because they have a great network uh, or, or net worth or because they might introduce you to someone eventually, but just seeing them as a human being and that they exist, not that things don't exist to serve you, Things exist because they have their own purpose and existence and how to be respectful of that and not look at everything as something that could potentially be profitable. And so thinking about respectful design, I also think about uh, biomimicry and sustainability. And uh, in the low tech book that I mentioned earlier, Julia Watson describes the living root bridges and ladders of India. And I think this is one of the most amazing examples of uh, design not being self-serving, of it being very much of the, what the actual definition of sustainability is. And sustainability is rooted in the practice, indigenous practices, where you're thinking about seven generations ahead of you. You're not thinking about what can serve you in this moment. Sustainability actually is rooted in the practice of indigenous cultures, where they're thinking about how can they create something that will benefit? How can they be mindful of what they're creating and how it might impact people that are seven generations away from them? And so with the living root bridges and ladders of India, these were created because in these parts of India, there are heavy monsoons, heavy rains, downpour of uh, uh, strong rains and winds that destroy manufactured bridges using material that they have around them, whether it's wood or anything else. And so what they found was no matter how much they are investing in creating these bridges, they're still being wiped away due to natural causes. And so how can they use something that will last for a much longer time um, and while they're thinking about this, they're thinking about uh, roots, roots growing on these different trees, and their tactic is guiding these roots to grow in a certain way, and these roots then become an extremely durable material that allows for them to uh, live and navigate between these different communities that they would have cut off uh, without the bridges. And so this is a process that takes can take 30 years, but it's the strongest technology that they have access to. And so to create something that could actually take a few decades, thinking about generations ahead, this is the actual form of sustainable design that we need to be thinking about. Uh, it's not so much about what we are able to benefit from in the moment, but what uh, the people that are coming after us can benefit from. 
And then also think about uh, the indigenous practices of African uh, cultures. Uh, and so indigenous African design has been something that I've really thought a lot about, especially with fractal systems. Uh, and so this is a, a example of urban of settlements of community settlements and their design. And um, when European settlers came onto the continent and saw the way that the African people were living, they actually did not, they thought that what they were doing, things like this was, was examples of them being primitive, of them not being intelligent, them, you know, um, creating systems that don't make sense. But actually what they were doing was beyond what uh, these visitors could comprehend. It was such an advanced form of uh, geometry that only existed both on the continent and in India at the time. And it was very much in response to culture and land, uh, where land being something that's really important because uh, the way that we generally design in the Western world is through Euclidean sort of urban design, where we have these parallel lines and we're designing on streets that go north, south, and east, west. Uh, and instead with, you, with uh, African fractal sort of urban design, or design in general, communal design, it's in response to the land, the movement of the land, the topology of the land. And it's not so much about uh, creating, imposing these systems, very structured systems, but it's much more about engaging in the world naturally. And so for me, uh, as I shared with the designing a museum 350 years in the future, it's really important that we're working backward. That's, that, that's a form of uh, design of having this vision far out into the future and then creating a plan for it uh, by rooting ourselves in the, our reality and reflecting on this vision and thinking of what steps do we need to take in order to manifest that vision. So if I want something to exist hundreds of years in the future, what would be required for me to be doing now and incrementally uh, towards the future to get to that point? And so that's what building the, the museum 350 years in the future was. It was creating this idea of this is something that's gonna exist into 2350. Um, and then reflecting on what is it uh, that we have now that could then influence that? And how can we think of ourselves as future ancestors, which is also a really important mind frame as a designer of your future ancestor, you are eventually going to become an ancestor to a group of people coming in behind you. And so again, with the sustainability tactic, how can we make sure that what we're doing is healthy and beneficial in a comprehensive way? And so currently uh, what I'm doing with Afrotectopia, which is in the midst of an incubator between New York University's Interactive Telecommunications Program, MIT Space Exploration Initiative, and supported by the Ford Foundation, is we're thinking a lot about this form of design of it's not so much about uh, responding and reacting to the moment that we have at hand. It's about thinking about who is coming after us, who is going to experience this. It's about thinking about uh, indigenous forms of uh, design of, thinking very inclusively of all sentient life and making sure that we're reflecting on the way that everything will experience the work that we're creating. And so what it's taken form is, uh, we have been thinking for the past about five months on space life. And in a time where so many people are engaging and, and actually going out into space um, and creating um, potentials for more people to go into space, what does it mean for a group of Black people to come together and think about space life, even in the midst of us having to deal with so many other ideas and so many other uh, forms of oppression, um, and to actually give ourselves this agency to think about something that's beyond our circumstances, but to think of something so far and potentially not even that far in the future where we're getting ahead and we're thinking about what would it be like to engage in extraterrestrial worlds and what does it mean to travel in space? And so what we've been exploring is this idea of space travel as not so much of this about being the destination, but more about being the journey of this process that we're navigating as we're moving from uh, the Earth's orbit and entering other orbits of what can that mean as a spiritual experience? How can we reorient ourselves as human beings? How can we think about our role within the world and our ecology um, to be something that's beneficial to all sentient beings? And so this is just a screenshot of a few of the different uh, work that we've been exploring and creating. Um, one artist is exploring the spacesuit and creating an entirely different spacesuit that is more immersive to the body. Um, we're thinking about sustainable materials. We're thinking about a whole new form of a spiritual practice, a different form of a geomancy. And we're generally thinking about this interconnected relationship between sentient beings when existing in the outer world. And 
So for me, uh, what I want to push to you all as future designers is to, to really encourage you to move from being reactionary to being visionary. So not being so tied to the moment and trying to respond to the immediate concerns, but to actually take a, a step far into the future and think about what it is it actually that you want to manifest and working backwards from there. And that would then require us moving away from yearning for instant gratification, which we're, tra we're trained so well with social media and wanting to post things and immediately get attention for it and recognition for it, but to actually be sustainable in our approach, to not run quickly and try and realize all of these great things so in such a short amount of time, but to actually be careful and intentional about every decision that we're making uh, and to not think so much about how we can serve ourselves, but to think about how we can serve the generations that are existing after us. So I also encourage you to always question status quo. So I think that's a, a big part of the Benjamin Bryan quote that I shared of just, this is your opportunity to redesign the design, 21st century design is about redesigning 20th century plurality, which is so much of what Omni Specialized Design is. It's thinking about a variety of different identities and ideas, centering justice. So it's not so much about, um, for me, it's very much about how can we make sure that we're at the core of all that we're doing, we're centering equitability and justice for all living. And to play the long game, again, about sustainability and um, not being so tied to immediate uh, gratification. And so to wrap this with Arturo Escobar's quote of ontological design stems from a seemingly simple observation that in designing tools, we are creating ways of being. We design our world and our world designs us back. In short, design designs. So tying it even into the quotation, the quote on, uh, we have to create a different conversation. We have to create new narratives. Everything that we're designing is then going to design us back. Technology, the way that we use it, then decides how uh, technology will then serve in the future. So it's, it's really about simply observing and discerning and creating um, and understanding that whatever we are creating, it then creates us. My bibliography, uh, highly recommend these books, Victor Papanek, Politics and Design, Low Tech by Julie Watson, Pattern Thinking, but Mr. Fuller, African Fractals, Rana Glash, and Designs for the Pluriverse by Arturo Escobar. So that is all. Happy to answer questions. Thank you so much, Adi. That was wonderful. Um, I think we have two questions queued up. For building futurists who don't have a background in making things, i.e. industrial design, what resources would you recommend to learn at least the basics of these other disciplines to enhance our omni design? Great questions, a really good question. Um, and that also reminds me that I, what I didn't include in uh, this presentation was the importance of entering spaces that you are not an expertise in and still trying to explore what does it mean if you were to engage in that world. So with industrial design, I think, especially in the design world, um, as important as it is to be trained in that area, it's also, uh, it's not, uh, it shouldn't create a barrier for people to also explore that as well. So industrial designers, yes, you can go to university program that teaches you how to be an industrial designer. Even with architecture, yes, you should, uh, you can go to a school and be trained as an architect, but that doesn't mean that the only people that have ever existed have done industrial design or architecture have been people that have been trained at universities. There's a lot of importance in just being embedded within communities and being embedded within situations that would require those sorts of uh, practices um, to do it in, in person and to learn on the go and to learn from people that uh, are around you. So I think for me, an important research is conversation of understanding what other people have done um, and learning from them of, uh, and, and you know, not creating this, not allowing yourself to be uh, barred through not having the training from it. Um, other things I would say, and that just generally requires you to just try and just create to not even have the role of an industrial designer, but just to think of an industrial designer and how they are creating products and creating your own products and exploring what does that mean and what are considerations that you're having and have conversations with what are their responses to the things that you're making. I think generally with any of that, my biggest recommendation is just to create, if you're not an architect, to create a house and design that and not stop not having a degree within that uh, to create that. And I mean, just like creating mock-ups and those sorts of things, of course, when you're like actually designing a house that requires you, you need a lot of help uh, like um, with structural engineering and all those sorts of things. But um, for me, the biggest thing is just get in and try. Great, be generative. 
Exactly. Um, what helps the communities or people you work with to imagine a hundred years into the future? Another great question. I think, um, at least with the community that I worked with in this situation, and then also just generally working with Aptopia, is it's really just creating that space. It's kind of like being in a classroom, and um, you, the professor, has designed a syllabus around a certain subject area, and now you have this whole. Uh, mental capacity to explore that subject area simply because the professor has designed that space. I think when it's it was thinking about speculative design, it's merely you're just creating the space for people to have the agency to then think in that way. So when it comes to designing 100 years in the future, one thing that helps me is I think a lot of what also helps is just creating examples. So uh, when I worked with, uh, when I developed the course designing um, with the, the revolution course that I shared earlier, uh, I shared that the practice that I had done um, um, shared practices that other people had done so that people can see other people that are thinking very far into the future and then working backwards at the very least having uh, a concept to build off of um, and so they can build off of that but I think the core of that is really just creating this environment that uh, would allow people to feel like okay they can think about designing 100 years in the future and being very encouraging um, for anyone that's joining Christina's course uh, where we're doing the workshop on omni specialized design a lot of that, a lot of what we're doing is really just uh, being imaginative about throwing things together that you would never combine together traditionally, but just having that agency to feel like you can combine what might happen if you put pottery and uh, biomolecular science together and what can you create within that. I think it's just, it's really just creating that, that mental space for people. The next one kind of dovetails with that. How do you find balance between thinking a hundred years into the future while being present in your body and in the moment with others? Yeah, that's good. Um, I think uh, the balance is, um, I think it's that constant returning to the past, turn, returning to where you are in the moment, but also then being reflective of where you're, you're trying to be. So it, it's not so much of a linear uh, pr process of think far out in the future and then only think moving backwards. It's more of you're constantly reflecting on what is this future that you wanna uh, exist within. And then you're constantly reflecting on what is this world that you currently exist within, not operating based off of this world that you currently lived within to design this future, uh, really freeing yourself and allowing yourself to be very imaginative, but at the very least uh, having that constant dialogue between the, the very far out future and the past. And I think this idea of um, this bodily intelligence of um, being present in your body and in the moment, I think is also really important because um, I think there's also this emotional intelligence that we often overlook. And emotional intelligence is a really important capability for all of us to have, which we're not taught in school, but this ability to navigate our emotions and our feelings uh, and to understand why do we feel the way that we do in certain spaces or in certain environments, which then could lead you into exploring psychogeography. If there's an actual practice of understanding how spaces and the construction of them, of architecture, of urban design, how all of that then influences your psychology and way of being. And to not negate emotions as a sort of like trivial idea, but that it's actually really important to explore the way that you feel uh, and how you're feeling in your body. Um, and just that having that in constant dialogue with your speculative design. Can you say a little bit about what you're doing so far in Studio Forward? Or what you yeah. will do, I guess? <laughs> yeah. Um, so that will be a workshop on uh, Omni Specialized Design where it's inviting participants to, um, for one, really free themselves from the realities of the world and think about um, entirely alternative realities. And in doing that, uh, just encouraging a lot of creativity and exploration. Um, but also very reflective on the practices that I've shared here of ways that we can engage in design in a very sustainable and respectful and ecologically centered form. Uh, so first being very imaginative and creating these small prototypes that are in no way realistic or no way intended to be realistic. And then moving from that space uh, where we're shaking loose the con constraints of reality and entering a space where we can think in a very creative way, but all about something that's real and within this world, how can we create a solution that's serving of people, um, that's not self-serving, but serving of a community of people, not designing for, but designing with, what would be required of that? How can we tap into the expertise of the community that we're designing um, with and create a potential uh, product or experience or uh, something like that? 
Lovely. So hi says, thank you for the great talk. So thought provoking. And given that nature isn't driven by a designer or with an intended beneficiary in mind, how do we come to terms with how to ethically work with nature? For example, how can we know that we are considering the best interests of other sentient beings? Oh, excellent question. Uh, that's a really good question. Um, and there are so many examples of where that's done wrong um, of, uh, you know, people that are trained in urban design or um, these sorts of practices within the Western world and talk extensively about uh, horticulture and botany and all these sorts of things. Um, but how different those tactics can be from indigenous communities and uh, how these indigenous communities have been able to serve the land best, how we even have government grants that are designed to you know, protect land, but it's actually destroying the land and not allowing for indigenous communities to do uh, a lot of the tactics that they've done for so long um, because we have this new trained philosophy on the ways that we should be engaging with the land. So I definitely don't think I have a question, I have an answer to that. I think it's um, for me, my, what my strategy has generally been is just studying what have indigenous people um, done? Not to say that they're always correct, but they generally have a very strong understanding of the natural world because it, it was a technology that they were so tapped into far beyond, far, far before we had digital technologies and far before we had uh, university programs around that. So reflecting on, I think it's just a lot of research and understanding in that way, trial and error, of course. Um, but I think, uh, and a lot of it can also just be like very clear indicators of, you know, flowers and uh, horticulture not uh, blooming in its healthy estates or just like this, a lot of natural devastation. I wouldn't, uh, uh, as much as I'm exploring this area, I wouldn't know currently um, how to tap into the minds of sentient beings, but I think it's generally a lot of uh, research and understanding of what indigenous communities have done so far. Thank you. We have two more questions. Do you have a few more minutes? Yep. Yeah, I can. Thank you. Please share your thoughts behind your physical computation for sound project and how it might support epigenetics towards healing. Yeah, so that's a that's a project that's uh, that's referencing a project I didn't share. Um, and that's referencing a couple projects. Actually, there's a on my website, I have like a overlay of some work where it uh, highlights like physical computation for sound. And those are in relation to sound sculptures that I've created of um, bringing together a bunch of different sensors uh, and thinking about how can I redesign the sonic composition experience where as opposed to composing and creating music in traditional forms like strumming strings on a guitar or playing the keys on the piano, instead of using sensors like phototransistors or light cells or uh, soft room potentiometers, all these different sensors and allowing people to then create music uh, through you know, different ways of being, of moving. Um, though that's what, what's uh, being referenced for physical computation for sound. And then my explanation, explorations in epigenetics uh, through sound is another project that I created called Metamorphosis, which you everyone can um, visit. Uh, I'll type it in here. All you do is type in metamorphosis.fm. It's a website. Um, and so when you go there, that's a web VR experience that I created where I was thinking specifically about uh, exploring a lot of ep the, this idea of epigenetics or the science behind epigenetics of how, for anyone that doesn't know epigenetics, that's basically um, when you are, uh, how through DNA, how through ancestral, uh, uh, through your ancestry, you can have your, your body, your DNA is affected by the experiences that your ancestors have experienced um, and how that is different traumatic, traumatic moments can reconfigure the structure of your DNA and that being epigenetics and me thinking about how can it be not a trauma-based uh, form? Uh, how can the science not be so focused on trauma, but instead, how about, uh, could this potentially be a form of healing? Can we actually reverse the way that we think about epigenetics, where we actually reconfigure our DNA through meditation and sound healing and a bunch of different healing modalities? And so that's what I explore with metamorphosis.fm of, I wanted these healing modalities to be um, accessible. So it's a web VR platform. It takes a little bit to load on your computer 
computer just because it's, it's a pretty heavy file, but um, thinking about how it can use sound and light and color to potentially reconfigure our, our DNA and using sound and light and color in specific ways that are tapping into different energy centers like chakras, uh, which is a, a Eastern uh, practice, spiritual practice. Uh, and knowing how different sound frequencies can actually tap into those different chakras, creating an environment that allows you to navigate the different chakras through sound and visuals. Thank you for that. We just have one more question. Thank you for your time today, Ari, Addy. For folks interested in this form of design, I'm curious what sort of tactical advice you might have to find communities and relevant spaces to contribute to. Would you say there are a lot of spaces that already exist or would you say there are more spaces to be created? Um, that's a great question. I think oftentimes we uh, try and create spaces um, because we see a need that doesn't exist. And I think the first step is always to see if that community already exists. I think it, you never wanna reinvent the wheel. Um, so for one, finding to see if those communities exist um, but sometimes they don't, and then that can be a great opportunity for you to create your own. Um, I think uh, trying to revisit this question of advice and finding communities, I think it's, uh, it's so dependent on what you're trying to do. So say it's that you are trying to create a STEAM program for a public school that generally just doesn't have much tech equipment. Um, I mean, the first step would be going to that school to be going to the PTA. It, it's, it's kind of just like, what community are you invested in serving and finding who are the community leaders? Where are those people generally congregating? Um, like uh, what are the systems around that community that you could then speak to and see what they have access to and what do they not have access to? Uh, I think it's really important to get to know the community and just be a part of the community for a while. I think oftentimes we have these really great ideas and we think we know the solution for it. Um, but that actually might be very far away from what the community needs. So it's often really important to just take your time doing this. Some things can feel really urgent, but what you really need to do is just embed yourself in the community, have conversations, see what they have already tried to do. A lot of times, uh, you know, these communities have already tried to create solutions for their problems. So what is it that they've already tried to do and how can you build off of the expertise that they've already done? But the most important thing is really being embedded within that community. Um, and yeah, I think it would, it would really have to be starting from there. Once you're embedded in the community, you know who to talk to, uh, to find out who has done what, whatever they've done in the past or who might be great to contribute in this or who can you learn from, et cetera. I, I would say the number one is embedding yourself. 